fluff the hair. Fluff the hair. Hi, everybody. We're just waiting for our friends at Vibe Network to join us, and then we will get started. It'll just be a minute. I well, hope everybody is getting all ready for uh, St. Patrick's Day. St. Patrick's Day. Because, yeah, I'm wearing shiny shame rocks. Because it's you, fun. As you do. Look at and maybe 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 you can do this without technical difficulties tonight. Hey hey hey, watch your drinks. And we have kittens, so as you can see, tails kittens. They're right, everywhere. Where are you doing? We're surrounded by kittens. Yes, we are, and we love them dearly. Your show will go live in five seconds. Four, three, two. One. Love Talk Radio. All right, so now we got everybody with us. Yay! Our friends in Facebook land, our friends at the Vibe Radio Network, and we are all ready to go and uh, chat about some uh, spooky Irish stuff tonight. You know, it's been almost... Cheers! Yeah, cheers. <laughs> it's been almost two years since we... Chatted about how in Ireland. Well, no, we did it last year, didn't we? I don't remember. I'm pretty sure we did some Irish stuff last year, okay. too. Even though we're calling this part two, our records are kind of somewhat incomplete. Well, the first one was just with the Vibe Network, and so we didn't have a computer script. So that's problem number one. I'm pretty sure the first time... It was on paper. I wrote it. I remember. Yeah, we sat here in front of the fireplace on our phone in the upright position, making a very awkward video. I'm pretty sure we did Irish spirits that time. Probably. Nah. There's but, plenty of them in Ireland, by the way. Yeah, we've mm -hmm. come a little ways since then. Yeah, now we, uh, now we, now we actually got, uh, got, got a couple tablets to work with. <laughs> and, and I think there's going to be a light ring in the future. A little, little bit more of a, I dare not say professional. This is not professional. And it'll just be better lighting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, no, nothing, nothing about this is professional in any way, shape, or form. <laughs> but it's fun. Yes, and is. that's why we're still here doing it some, I, I didn't count recently, I'm assuming we're 60 to 70 episodes in, in now. Yep. So, yeah, it's been, been going for a while. Yep. But cheers everybody. Yes, cheers. Cheers. We're happy to have you with us. Yep, hope everybody is uh, having a, a good uh, spring so far as, um, as far as uh, spring will go or around here yes. with uh, the, the wild temperature swings and all that good stuff. The snow but, and the pollen and the, oh my. <laughs> yep, and the 80 degree temperatures. But, yep, I am all ready to go here. I got a cat. I have my Guinness. I have my Jameson. I have my hot toddy down Beth, there. Beth has her hot toddy with some good uh, Irish whiskey in it as well. And we're ready to go. Yeah, are we all ready to go now? I think we're ready to go. But yeah. I, <laughs> I say hi, Patrick. Hi, Alex. Hi, Mom. Yeah. I can't read anything underneath the names. Yep. <laughs> Patrick says, happy Monday. Looking yes. forward to some fun Irish ghost stories. Alex says, top of the evening, all. Salon. Salon, And Mom says, good evening, everyone. <laughs> all right. So. All right. So we're going to um, head off to County Sligo. For our first story, um, this is in the northwest of Ireland. It's rural, it's wild country. Uh, it's known for its rugged coastline, its mist-shrouded mountains, its winding waters, which blend together to inspire the poetry of the course legendary local poet, poet William Butler Yeats, who we have talked about with our hauntings before. He's involved with an awful lot of hauntings in Ireland, by the way. I'm discovering this. Yeah, we're going to talk about him a couple times today. Yeah, I, I knew he was fascinated with the subject and the paranormal, but I didn't realize just how fascinated. It's cool. Thank you, Yates. I liked you before. I really like you now. Got, anyway. a, little bit, got a little bit more about him in there with the paranormal stuff. Yes, I did. Yeah. So, Yates um, passed away in 1939, and when he did, he was laid to rest in Drumcliff Cemetery in the shadow of the dramatic and imposing uh, Bendelblum Mountain. Now, while very much involved with the world around him, Yates was also very interested in the paranormal and believed wholeheartedly that the demise of our physical form was not the end of our existence. In fact, he was at one point a member of the Ghost Club. It was uh, the oldest paranormal investigation organization in the world. Yates certainly didn't need to look far for paranormal inspiration. At Sligo County, uh, it was actually widely known as a hotbed of supernatural. 
Was that your phone? Or mine? Yeah, it that was, was mine. your phone. Okay. okay. I thought I silenced it, but apparently I didn't. <laughs> so we're going to go to Lizardale House uh, first. And this is overlooking Drumcliff Bay. Uh, Drumcliff Bay, excuse me. Uh, north of County Sligo, where we find Lizardale House. It was built between 1830 and 1835, and it was the house of childhood home of Irish Revolutionary Countess Constance Gore Booth and her sister, the poet and suffragette, Ava Gore Booth. Gore Booth. Gore that's Booth. A, that's a pretty, pretty. That's a fun name. Pretty cool name. <laughs> um, I wonder any any um, relationship to the Gore sisters. Good question. I did not see that in the research, but it's a good question. Yeah. yeah I mean. Uh, Eva, Ava, mm -hmm. maybe. Anyway, um, their sister or their siblings also lived there. That was Maybell Gorbuth and Modorant Gorbuth and Jocelyn Gorbuth. A lot of fun names. Uh, Constance and Ava were both prominent players in the Irish independence movement in the late 19th century. Constance was also a female MP in any uh, European parliament um, before even. Uh, Lady Nancy Astor in the British Parliament. Okay, this is going to be fun. Hi, dude. Now, both of them were very strong women and, of course, ahead of their time. Yates would often visit the Gorbus and vacation at their house. Their uh, home and sisters helped inspire one of his poems, and in 1927, he immortalized this house and the Gorbus sisters in his poem in memory of Ava Gorbuth and Con Markowitz. Merkowitz was being, uh, being the married name of Constance. Lizdale House is a Greek Revival style mansion with two stories over a basement. It was the last home in this style to be built in Ireland. <laughs> Thank you, dude. Okay. Cats. Yes, cats. Uh, it stands for an icon of Ireland's historic and literary and garden her heritage. For their part, the Gorbuth sisters were very kind, generous, and provided employment to many who had need of work. This generosity bridged the often violent political lines that crossed Ireland during the early 1900s. For this reason, folks sought to work for the Lisdale, and they spoke of the sisters with gratitude and affection. Unfortunately, Lisdale was also known sometimes to have a dark and complex history due to turbulent threats surrounding the house. Like their friend Yates, the sisters were believed to dabble in the occult. There was frequently talk about Ouija board sessions in the property's basement and sometimes even practicing of black magics. In the years after the Gorbus passed away, the home stood neglected. In 2003, the Cassidy Walsh family purchased the property and took to restoring it to its former glory. The family lives in the home and welcomes visitors to tour the property and participate in special events highlighting, highlighting Lizdale's colorful history. The rumors of the occult practices by the Gorbus were true. They may have been inspired by some of the paranormal goings-ons at Lizdale. Uh, one of their relatives, Mabel Olive Gorbuth, wrote of this paranormal encounter at the house in February 1891. On the 10th of April, 1889, about half past 9 a.m., my youngest brother and I were going down the short flight of stairs leading to the kitchen to fetch food for my chickens, as usual. We were about halfway down when my brother, a few steps advanced of me, when he suddenly said, why, there's John Blaine Blarney. I didn't know he was in the house. John Blaney was the boy who had not lived far from us. He had been employed in the house as a hall boy not long before. I said I was sure it was not he, for I knew... He had left some months previously on account of ill health, and looked down the passage and saw no one. The passage was a long one and rather sharp turn in it, and we ran quickly down the last few steps, looked around the corner, but nobody was there, and only the door uh, he could have gone through was shut. As we went upstairs, my brother said, how pale and ill John looked, and why did he stare so? I asked him what he was doing. My brother answered that he had... His sleeves turned up and was wearing a large green apron, such as a footman always wear when they work. An hour or two afterwards, I asked my maid how long John Blaney had been back at the house, and she seemed much surprised at this. Didn't you hear, miss? He died this morning. On inquiry, we found he had died about two hours before my brother saw him. My mother did not wish my brother 
shouldn't be told this, but he heard of it somehow and once declared that he must have seen his ghost. The recordings of hauntings at Lisdell didn't end there. Yates played a part in his own witness in his life. Uh, years after his passing, Yates actually had, uh, had been said to present himself from time to time in the grand rooms of the house, which seemed to be fitting since he enjoyed his times there so much. But Yates also had a personal encounter at Lisdale, as he claimed to see the spirit of one of his deceased friends on the main staircase. An experience surely served to, open, uh, to deepen Yates's belief in fascination in the paranormal. In the years that followed the Gorbuth family's departure from Lisdale, people would report seeing spirits of two women wandering the estate's beautiful garden. They carried with them flowers and painting tools, leading many to believe that the famous Gorbu sisters returned to their family home and that they're still engaging in some of the hobbies they enjoyed during their lives. Unfortunately, not all the spirits that linger around Lisdale seem to have happy, adventurous, or comfortable backstories. From the estate grounds looking down onto Drum Drumcliff Bay, a phantom ship is sometimes seen that can be identified as one of many coffin ships that was intended to transport refugees from the Great Potato Family from Ireland to North America. These ships earned their nickname due to the deplorable conditions on board that sometimes or often resulted in mort mortality rates as high as 30% on any given voyage. It may be that the phantom ship was sunk in the bay or simply an echo of that great misery that would have been experienced by those on board. Regardless of what might still be seen there, the nature of the spectral vessel stands in its stark contrast to the spirits of the well-to-do at Lisdale. Any questions, concerns? Uh, I see no. a happy, flappy face. Yep. Roberta said hello to the kitty cats. Oh, hi, babies. And Vincent decided to give me a chomp. Nosh, 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 nosh. Because that's what Vincent does sometimes. Vincent has decided he's a nosher now. Particularly me. He doesn't, well, he does it occasionally to me. Not nearly as often. Anyways, we're not going to be going too far. We're going to be staying in uh, County Sligo. And uh, our next stop, we're just going to slide a little bit to the south, to the outskirts of the town of Strand Hill. Here we can find the ruins of a once grand manor referred to as Lachine House, overlooking Ballasdare Bay. The land where Lachine House is located was inherited by a man named William Phibbs in the early 1800s. William had estates totaling a few thousand acres in Coolera and throughout the county, and was a man of considerable wealth. Not long after acquiring his inheritance, he decided to build a residence that would reflect the family's opulence and rival, if not surpass, other manor houses of the county. Thus, in 1842, a mansion was built and named Seafield House. William's son, Owen, toured Egypt and Syria as an archaeologist and brought back several artifacts to Seafield. Hence, the building became a sanctuary that housed a huge collection of those esoteric artifacts. Allegedly, these artifacts would be brought out for use during rituals, which took place in the long gallery on the first floor of Seafield. The artifacts included Egyptian mummies, swords, and daggers, all in all, not the kind of stuff that we would recommend messing around with. Yep. No. But, one day, local rumors started to fly around, asserting that a coach with a very curious visitor had stopped by Seafield. The rumors identified this visitor as Satan himself. Following this unexpected visitor, the house was then subjected to intense, violent, and malicious poltergeist activity, as objects including pottery, Ornaments and even furniture was constantly smashed every night. A strange figure was often seen on the stairway at night, and sometimes the manifestation was so violent the house shook to its very foundations. It was reported that one of the gardeners saw a dark figure running across the grounds laughing maniacally until he disappeared into the waters of the bay below. The gardener fled, never to return. Can't say a blind guy. No. It is also said that a coach with four horses is sometimes seen charging full tilt towards the front door near midnight, only to disappear just before reaching it. What is it with coaches and four horses in Ireland? I don't know. The local local lore, myths and lores? I mean, the, the death coach is one of them. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yep. 
but in the wake of all this paranormal mayhem, the name was changed from the Seafield House to the Lachine House in 1899. Because a name changes everything, right? Yeah, the leading theory was that this was done to try and confuse and distract the entities that were wreaking havoc on the estate, but unfortunately for the Fibbs family, it did not work. Shocking. <laughs> the house was vacated in 1938 after all of the staff had resigned and the family could find no one to work there due to the supernatural activity taking place. Eventually, the property's contents were removed and surrendered to the entities uh, and the building surrendered to the entities which still occupy the ruin today. Could the ris uh, rituals that were rumored to take place at Lachine have unleashed the unrest? It's a question that draws in paranormal investigators and enthusiasts from around the world. Most notably, in 2007, Lachine House was featured on the TV series Ghost Hunters. The show told of Owen Fibbs alleged grave robbing in the Middle East and suggested that they heard unearthly sounds coming from the basement. Visitors will find that the ruins of Lachine House are saturated with a sense of foreboding and dread. Some call the walls aggressive. Aggressive walls. Aggressive in their nature. And many say the ruins are a place of evil. Today it is known as the only confirmed poltergeist haunting in all of Ireland. Who's up for it? Dun dun dun. Let me fix the wall if that has fallen. I will do so. Thank you. Any comments? I see Patrick posted a picture. Yep, uh, uh Lissadale Lissa House. Oops. Yeah. Dude, what are you doing? Cat stuff. No. It's like a bowling ball. It is launching itself. It's a cannonball. He is a big boy. With claws. Are you settled yet, dude? Well, count on. Alright, so we're going to go to Mark, Mark Three Castle. Uh, still in Sligo, by the way. Um, this is actually built in 1630, uh, excuse me, 1663 by Cornet Edward Cooper. Uh, he was allotted the original 14th century Mercury Castle and all the surrounded lands. It was in recognition of defeating the O'Brien clan in service for Oliver Cromwell during the Irish Confederate Wars. Until that time, Marcree had been a fortified outpost, a, outpost of the Irish McDonough clan, guarding the ford across the river Mushin. Connor O'Brien died in battle, and Edward married his widow, Maria Rua, or Red Mary. With her two sons, they went on to live at Drumline Castle. One son, Donna, was left Drumlin, and the other inherited Markey. For centuries thereafter, the Cooper family would reside at Markey, and with interruptions only during the Nine Years' War in the early 1690s, and again during the Irish Civil War in the 1920s. Aside from serving as a fortress, Markey has evolved much, around, uh, much over the generations. Uh, survived over the much over the generations. The castle, as we see it today, dates actually from 1802, with exterior changes by the architect Francis Johnston, and with some changes made mainly to the interior in 1896. From 1830 until 1902, the estate hosted an observatory. It was commissioned by Colonel Edward Joshua Cooper, and the telescope there was the largest in the world for a number of years. After the Second World War, the castle fell on hard times and stood empty and derelict for many years. In 1988, it appeared on the front cover of the Vanishing Country Houses of Ireland, a testament to the sad state of decay of many of Ireland's great houses. In 1889, the last of the Cooper family members, Charles Cooper, transformed his ancestral castle into a hotel. The castle's restoration was featured on television, excuse me, on a television documentary and the renewed facilities featured a hotel and restaurant. The castle is set on 500 acres of gardens and wooded areas. The public areas have been preserved with period features, furnishings, and traditional open fires. There are 31 beautifully appointed bedrooms offering guests an alternative to the large corporate style hotels while still being able to access a very modern convenience. Okay, why don't we leave? Sarah looking for plane tickets. 
In the same way uh, that the living are assured a warm welcome, a Marquee Castle Hotel has also embraced its resident phantom. A little girl haunts this property, and her activity is regular enough that the staff and guests now refer to her as Pippa. Pippa is a friendly and playful, but sometimes mischievous spirit. She is known to lock guests in their rooms, cause staff to drop plates, and to generally engage in trouble. The owners have apparently learned that one way to avoid experiencing her tricks is to bring her a gift. One Christmas, the owners brought Pippa a present, and this seemed to calm her down for a time. An American couple who came to Ireland to get married at Marquis Castle brought with them presents for Pippa to ensure, ensure that their wedding went off without any paranormal mayhem. They enjoyed a happy and spirit-free celebration. Naturally, Pippa is drawn to young children. She, one guest brought her two-year-old uh, to the hotel and was surprised when she saw her talking to herself. The question, uh, when the child was asked, who are you talking to? says, well, she's talking to her friend and pointed towards a corner, but there's nobody there. The cellar's also rumored to be haunted, and it's only available to explore upon special request, and it's also at your own risk. <laughs> Mom says we don't give the, the boys enough attention. <laughs> I only spent three hours playing with them today. Clearly. Clearly, they are starved for attention. <laughs> They're just waiting for you, Mom. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh. Does Daddy I'll read? Yeah. You gonna read? Okay. <laughs> you can read with me. So, uh, we're finally gonna go and leave County Sligo. Uh, just for now. Just for now. Just for now. Yeah. We're, not, we're not coming back to it in this show. We'll but there's visit. more. There's more. Oh, there's always more. We're gonna go visit sometime. I really want to go to that castle. I kind of do, too. We haven't made it that far north. No, we haven't. The furthest north we've gone is actually around this next area. Mm -hmm. We're going to be going down to County Galway. And from once we hit uh, the county line, we're going to turn west until we get all the way to the far west coast to Inishbolfin Castle. Or, not Castle. Island. It's an island. Inishbolfin Island. And this is about eight miles off the coast of Connemara. Uh, now, I'm, if for... Uh, if you don't know, Connemara is a national park in mm -hmm. Ireland. You might have heard of Connemara marble, which is a green marble, absolutely gorgeous. That's where it comes from. Yeah. And a uh, beautiful, beautiful area. Now, Inishbofin first saw mention in ancient texts with the arrival of St. Coleman in the 7th century. The religious man had been exiled for arguing about the date of Easter. <laughs> don't I, get me started. They, I mean... Don't get me started. Talk about the things to get exiled over. Anyways, uh, in the Irish language, its name translates to the Island of the White Cow. Enish Bolfin, Island of the White Cow. Wow. This is a name that we're going to circle back to in a moment. Now, early mariners claim the island would appear and vanish in the fog. Modern sailors call it the crocodile, owing to the jagged profile it presents from afar. Located on the west of the island is Dungran, the rocky remains of a fort used in the early 17th century by Grace O'Malley, Ireland's legendary pirate queen. She ruled here, long, uh, ruled here along with her Spanish ally, Don Bosco, and they were said to have stretched chains across the waters to capture and loot ships. Located at the entrance to Inish Bolfin's protected mile-long harbor are the imposing ruins of Cromwell's Barracks, built in 1652. The barracks have diamond-shaped bastions at each of the four corners and constitute the best-preserved 17th century fortress in the country. The barracks were used to not only house soldiers, but also served as a penal colony for Catholic clergy that were performing masses and duties in direct violation of Cromwell's orders, thus committing high treason. This is also something we're going to circle back to on a later story, so just kind of keep that in mind. We'll bring it up again. No need to memorize things. This is not, there is not going to be a test, I promise. I didn't have time to make one. <laughs> now, anyways, as you might imagine, Treatment there was brutal, including summary executions. One unfortunate bishop was tied at low tide to Bishop's Rock, visible at the mouth of the harbor, where the waters rose and eventually drowned him. 
Islanders are steadfast in their belief that the ghosts of the priests still prowl the precipice that looms over the little harbor of the one of Ireland's most intriguing islands. No one can say for sure when the island became a settlement, or even what culture and religion the first settlers followed. As usually, there is a short as as unusually, excuse me, there is a shortage of archaeological evidence on Enishbolfin. That said, back to the white cow. Legend has it that two fishermen landed on Enishbolfin after becoming lost in the fog. They lit a fire and the flames began to burn off the mist. As their view became less obscured, they saw an old woman driving a white cow along a stretch of beach, separating Loch Bofin and the ocean. She struck the cow, and the fishermen saw that it turned to stone. It is said she and the cow appear every seven years, or to warn of impending doom. So she's like the great man. Yep, exactly. That was the first thing that came to mind when I saw that. And yes, Patrick, I agree that the arguing over the date of Easter is a very lame reason for exile, but I guess they just weren't messing around back in the day. <laughs> so, I'll carry on. I'll carry on. It's okay. I have a big baby. Yeah. So we are going to be moving back to the Irish mainland now. And uh, speaking, you know, talked to Connemara before, we're going to be going to the situ um, Connemara and situated in its stunning wilderness, we find Renville House, one of Ireland's most beautiful getaway destinations. Renville was first opened as a country house in 1883 by the Blake family. Since then, the historic building has played host to many well-known personalities, including Winston Churchill and, again, William Butler Yeats, the latter of whom actually spent his honeymoon there. It became a haven for poets, artisans, and politicians after it was purchased by Oliver St. John Gogarty in 1917, who himself was a well-known poet and surgeon from Dublin. The spirited tales about Renville House started at, during Gogarty's time as owner. His servants would refuse to stay in a certain upstairs room. They claimed to feel a dark and disturbing presence there. On one occasion, this strange entity supposedly pushed a large chest in front of the door, present, preventing access to the room. It was, just not, it was not just Gogarty's servants who experienced unexplained phenomena in the house. Gogarty himself also claimed to have come up against forces from another world. Late one night, he was awoken by the sound of footsteps coming from the corridor outside his room. He rose from his bed, lighting a candle to guide his way down the dark corridor. All of a sudden, the flame was extinguished, and a heavy tiredness fell upon Gorgerty, which he could never fully explain. It was during legendary Irish poets W.B. Yeats, or William Butler Yeats, we'll call him W.B. from this point forward. Yeats! Yeats. Now, during Yeats' stay at Renville, the activity reached an all-time high. As noted before, Yeats was deeply immersed in the paranormal, and he held a seance in the house with his wife, the well-known medium Georgie Yates. During the seance, Georgie used automatic writing to converse with the supposed spirit. This being stated that it was um, th this being stated that it was an unhappy with strangers staying in the house, but agreed to reveal its identity to Georgie. The spirit, according to Georgie, revealed itself in the form of a vaporous mist standing beside the fireplace. She described him as a red-haired teenage boy, pale, with an anguished expression on his face. Believed to be a member of the Blake family who constructed the grand house, the vision lurched around, wide-eyed, and clutching his hands to his throat. W.B. himself also experienced strange phenomena during his time in Renville. He claimed to have witnessed bedsheets being pulled from beds, sometimes with their occupants in tow. He also spoke of doors opening on their own and the sounds of pitiful groans echoing throughout the house. It is said by many guests that some of these ghosts have no respect for privacy. <laughs> Women have reported faces looking at them in the mirror as they began to undress. Perhaps this is the spirit of the man who is said to have strangled himself with his bare hands in the house. One thing is for certain, despite its breathtaking surroundings, it seems some unhappy guests of Renville House uh, Renville House Hotel have actually never left. How are you doing? I'm doing great. He seems to be doing great. My arm's getting numb. Your arm's getting numb? Well, you can do as you wish. 
Uh, let's see. You have Cromwell and the Puritans trying to take over the country and the rise of the tax turn. Yep. Lots of history there. I'll tell you what. You want to talk about crisscrossing, weaved up history. There's all kinds of wild, messed up stuff mm. in Irish history. Yep. Hey, it, I had to do some, uh, had to dive into some of these stories a little deeper than I might normally do because... He needed to understand. I needed to understand. Like, wait a second, weren't they fighting on the same side just a short while ago? Oh, got it. Okay. <laughs> now that I've been freed. And it's a theater that we're going to talk about. So, of course, you have I'm to stay I'm sorry, buddy. I did not need to do that. All right, so we're going to go to Galway City, which Chris and I have been to. Love it. Can't wait to go back. Uh, we did not go to this theater, though. No, we did not. They, I don't think they were having any shows when we were there. Uh, but this is Druid Lane Theater. Uh, now, it's a hotbed of history and culture, and Galway, of course, always holds the allure that will call you back if you ever have a chance to visit and go to its enchanting streets. In 1979, a theater group known as the Druid moved into an abandoned building close to the well-known Play Street, which is one of the oldest parts of Galway City. The building became known as Druid Lane Theater, and since the inception, the Druid had established one of the country's finest theaters, hosting performances of all manner of plays to raptures of rave reviews. The location itself is full of history. Archaeological digs uncovered the foundations of Galway's founder, Richard de Burgo, the Red Earl's castle. This added to the mythos of Druid Lane Theater, leaving it in a place of air and majesty and wonder. However, with all the theaters worth their salt, there appears, of course, to be a resident ghost, because you can't have a theater without one. Many of the buildings along Druid Lane were convents and nunneries throughout the 1970s. And it's here that our ghost centers, or enters into our story. Many people in the surrounding businesses and houses have claimed to have witnessed the specter of a nun walking down Druid Lane and the surrounding streets. The specter appears to be unaware of the attention she is drawing, perhaps lending to the theory that this is a residual haunting, a spirit stuck between her own realm and ours. Speaking of long special walks, we're going to go to the Long Walk in Galway City. It is one of the best known landmarks uh, in the city and it was an extension of the vibrant city caves uh, that are situated near the well-known Spanish Arch. Chris and I actually walked along this every single day that we were there. It's gorgeous. It is wonderful. Uh, the Long Walk is served as a favorite walking destination for three centuries. It's immortalized in the song and the works of art and an air of romanticism surrounds this well-known area. Stories of the strange and the unexplained have also been told uh, about this picturesque promenade, and many locals claim the place is a hotbed of hauntings. Tales of a mysterious lady in white being seen on the long walk on um, the Wolf Tone Bridge and the nearby village of Colada have been told for decades. Uh, if Colada sounds familiar, it's where the Colada Ring was founded and designed originally. It was in early 2012, however, that the most mysterious event on the Long Walk's history occurred. A local photographer was taking photographs in the area when, to his amazement, he noticed a strange image of a female figure dressed in a dark clothing standing in one of the shots. The woman does not appear in any of the other shots, adding to the mystery. Many people who have studied the photograph believe it is an apparition that, um, that is actually a 19th century nun from Colada. The possibility of the image being uh, simply a lone walker is unlikely, as the other photographs do not show the image. Who knows? Perhaps the apparition is simply camera, uh, camera malfunction, and it, of course, has been debated as such. But one thing is for certain. It's made a lot of people midnight take that midnight strolls along the long walk and hoping, or maybe fearing, to come face to face with the phantom. I will say, it, does, uh, it definitely does take on... Uh a very, you know, it's still beautiful, but a very creepy atmosphere yeah. we in were, the, late in the evening. We were there one night, it was a full moon, and there was flooding happening. So the, the river was up. Way up. Uh, and that's right where the river actually comes into the bay. And it, it just had a, this huge energy, like, mystery feeling about it. Mm -hmm. I would have been not surprised if we had seen something that night. <laughs> 
<laughs> yep. I have to go back. Yep. Now, now we know a little bit more of what we need to, what we need to look for. <laughs> we were just enjoying the beer and the, oh. the restaurants and the pubs and oh, the such old, good food. The, the, the music. The ancient cobblestone streets. Yeah. The, the, we were just enjoying the atmosphere. We weren't looking for specters. Uh, now we'll go back and enjoy the atmosphere and, and look, look for, for specters. Spectres. Because that's what you do. Yeah. That's what you do. <sighs> but, so, uh, anyways, we are going to move out of Galway City and just a little to the east, uh, to where we will find the village of Kilconnell. On the outskirts of this community lies the abandoned, yet breathtakingly beautiful, Woodlawn House. Woodlawn House holds the mantle of being one of the best-known abandoned houses in Ireland, and, and according to many, it may just be the country's most Excuse me. The country's most haunted. <laughs> Situated on 115 acres of scenic land, Woodlawn House features 26 bedrooms. Yes, 26 bedrooms. A gardener's house. House party. <laughs> a gatehouse and its own lake. It holds 365 windows, one for every day of the year. I'm not claiming those. <laughs> no. Woodlawn House was built in the late 1700s by the first Baron Ashtown, whose name was Frederick Trench. The house stayed in the family until 1973, after which it was sold to a local farmer. The house has seen a number of other owners since then, and there have been recent efforts to restore the home as a historic landmark. Everyone who has spent much time at the house in recent years, whether it be for restoration work or for use as a hauntingly beautiful filming backdrop, agree that something lingers on here. Rumors of a tragic suicide on the grounds of the house have led, um, have uh, helped fuel tales of paranormal encounters at the mansion. And when the makers of the hit horror movie The Blair Witch Project visited the house to film a documentary about Ireland's most haunted houses, they said the Woodlawn House was the scariest. Most days the house sits idle, heavily guarded by numerous security cameras, and many trespassers hoping to catch a glimpse of the place have been stopped in their tracks by local police, adding to the mystery of the house. Those lucky enough to get into the house, and it must be noted, we do not recommend approaching or entering the house without permission, claim to have experienced all manner of paranormal goings-on. Would-be ghost hunters say that they have heard the tormented wails of a girl in the house and sounds of phantom footsteps following them throughout the horrid hallways and the presence of an otherworldly entity in the mysterious hook room. Hook room, that's a hook room. Yeah. Makes me think of the horror movies with meat hooks and yeah. That's not what they mean here, but anyways. Woodlawn House may lie derelict and unused, but it does serve as yet another link to Ireland's haunted past. Gonna take us down south. All right, so we're gonna go down to County Cork and Priest Leap in Bantry. Um, as we go down the south coast, you get to County Cork. It's a beautiful corner of the country where Ireland's past, present, and natural, natural beauty weave a beautiful and sometimes tragic fabric that tells many tales. Along the northern border of Cor County Cork, where it meets County Kerry, we find a rugged Sheehy Mountains. There are a limited number of drivable passes through this range, and all of those that do exist can provide some white knuckle driving moments for those who are willing to brave the winding and narrow paths. One of these lanes is known as Priest's Leap. It's a steep single lane mountain road. It stands about 1,520 feet above sea level. With a name like that, you'd expect that there's a story associated with it. Justifiably so. Unfortunately, Ireland has a long, messy, and often violent history of religious strife. One of the most prominent and long-lasting stretches of religious disenfranchisement was marked by the penal laws, which gradually came into effect in the early 1600s and were effectively phased out in 1829. The enforcement of these laws was touch and go during their times on the books, but they were generally intended to encourage Catholics to accept Protestant rule. Encourage, in quotes. Yeah. Okay. Just a touch of sarcasm there. 
encourage. During the period of intense enforcement of the penal laws, Catholics would still try to go about their business, but if they needed to be subtle about it, of course. This business would include Catholic priests tending to those in their congregation. One such priest was going out on a sick call, and knowing that the authorities were observing him, he disguised himself and tried to sneak away. Unfortunately, the disguise did not work, and the soldiers took him to took to tracking the priest. A farmer was learning of the pursuit and sympathetic to the priest's peril, offered up a horse to help the priest escape. At this point, the soldiers in pursuit began in earnest. With soldiers closing down on the priest, he pressed his mount up into the mountains. The priest rode on until he faced a high cliff. It seemed that the soldiers had cornered their prey, but at that moment, the horse and rider leapt from the premises to certain death. At least that's what the soldiers were believed with good reason. When they reached the edge of the cliff, the soldiers looked below, fully expecting to see the priest and his horse dashed on the rocks below, but there was nothing there. One of the men then looked up in awe as he witnessed the horse and rider sailing through the air as if carried by God's hand before vanishing into the distance. Where the priest had faded from the sight of the soldiers, the town people in Bantry, about ten miles to the south, watched as someone or something came into their vision from the sky. They thought it was a bird at first, but as it neared them, they were struck with awe. A horse and rider both came down and struck the solid rock. Despite the, the speed of their inexplicable approach, their landing never made a sound. Both horse and rider were safely intact. It was as if at that moment the solid rock became like clay, softening the landing and leaving the imprint of horseshoes in the rock. The imprint of the priest's hands and knees also can be seen where the presumably shocked and relieved man collapsed to catch his breath. To this day, the stone can be seen on the side of a public road, and if, you're uh, if you brave the mountain that passes, mountain pass that bears the priest Leap's name, you will find a cross on the top where he and his horse made their faithful flight. So one of those fun legends. Yeah. We must have driven right by there yeah. on our first trip when we were heading from cork up to Galway the one day but this is uh, we took the the main route this yeah. is definitely uh priest's sleep is very much off the beaten path it was also being chased by rains going that day yes so i wouldn't be surprised that we didn't notice yeah no it was a torrential downpour coming well, after us <laughs> apparently priest priest leap is a one track road yeah so, I don't even think it's paved. And so, you weren't on it? No, we weren't on it. Bless and you. If, you uh, if you're going up, you need to be fully prepared that if you come nose to nose with another car, somebody may have to back down the road a little ways to uh, let the other one by. To find a, a pullover spot. Which isn't all that uncommon in the Irish yeah. backcountry. Uh, there are a lot of uh, one, one lane roads in the Irish backcountry where uh, if you find somebody going the other way, Somebody's got to bow out. Somebody's got to bow out. Uh, Patrick says, yeah, there was a stretch there where anyone who uh, professed belief in uh, transubstantiation couldn't hold public office in England, if memory serves, lots of encouragement. Yes, um, the, the last of those laws to roll off the books, I think it was in 1830s that we mentioned, yeah. um, that's, those were the laws that had, up until that point, actually prevented any Catholics from holding public office. Yeah. Including being teachers, which the priests normally were the, the teacher in town. Yeah. So, um, uh, so that, um, that was the last law to uh, be pretty much negated. Um, it actually wasn't until 1920, though, um, when... Uh, <coughs> Um, oh. The troubles happened? No, uh, well, the, the Irish, not the Irish Constitution, I, I'm blanking on it, but basically there was a, you know, a lot of the old laws were finally and completely wiped off oh. the books. Yeah. I mean, you know, there are, of course, records of those laws having existed, but instead of there being laws that basically countermanded the previous laws. They just rewrote it. They just rewrote it and said, nope, these are just simply not laws anymore, period. So, yeah. That, that was a, quite the long stretch there where um, being a Catholic in Ireland was not not a good thing. Whereas today, I think, what, three quarters of the Irish population is Catholic? Yeah. So, one of those things. Anyways. 
uh, staking around in County Cork, moving to the other end of County Cork, you will find the town of Cove, overlooking Cork Harbor. Now, Cove is spelled C-O-B-H. Yeah. Um, just so, just so you understand, if you want to look it up, if you're looking for Cove, C-O-B-H, and it's not far from um, the Cork City. Right. Um, just a Another very place we visited. A very gorgeous town. Yep. Very, very beautiful town. And uh, Cove overlooks Cork Harbor, and in the harbor lies Spike Island, one of Ireland's most haunted and eerie landmarks, with more than 100 acres and spanning a history going all the way back to the 7th century. So just to give you an idea, down in, Cork, uh, in Cove Harbor, you have the White Star Line building, which is where the Titanic left from, and Spike Island's just on the other side. So yep. that would have been their final kind of look at the land before they went out to the ocean. Yep, yep, the Titanic's last port of call, and there is a museum there dedicated to the, the Titanic. You got a company again. All right. All right, um, so yes, uh, Spike Island's history again <laughs> goes back to the 7th century, um, and its uh, location on the edge of the harbor initially made it just an isolated enough spot to be the perfect place for a mon monastic settlement back in the 7th century. However, as with nearly every inch of Ireland, the land changed hands many times through the subsequent millennia, before eventually being converted into a military fortification in the late 18th century, which still remains today as a historic landmark. The fortification that dominates the island today is known as Fort Mitchell. In addition to helping secure Cork Harbor from would-be invaders, Fort Mitchell would also serve as a prison starting in 1847, with a capacity of over 2,300 prisoners. It was the largest prison in the world at the time, uh, and there has never been a larger prison in Ireland or Britain before or since. Although some inmates had committed serious and gruesome crimes, most of Spike Island, uh, Spike's inhabitants, um, uh, most, of, most of Spike's inhabitants were imprisoned for minor crimes like stealing, which was quite common during the Great Famine. For most of these prisoners, it was a temporary stop before they were deported to Australia. It gained a reputation as Ireland's Alcatraz. In the years of service, thousands experienced the squalid conditions of the island prison. It's worth noting that in those early years of the prison service, Spike Island also served as the first place in Ireland where Queen Victoria set foot in 1849. For over 70 years, the modern town of Cove was named Queenstown in her honor. Aside from housing thieves and murderers, in 1916 the facility hosted the crew of the Odd. The Odd was a disguised German ship holding guns to be used in the Easter Rising. Though the crew were transferred to a prison camp in England, they were amongst the first of the many prisoners to be held at Fort Mitchell during the Irish War of Independence. After the establishment of the Irish Free State, the Royal Navy retained control of the territory until July 11, 1938, when it was formally handed over to Ireland remaining as a military base and prison under Irish rule. About a half a century later, one of the most ruthless riots in prison history, the riot of September 1, 1985, took place at Fort Mitchell. Trouble broke out when the few officers on duty were quickly overpowered. Block A caught fire and was destroyed. Rioting prisoners armed themselves with slash hooks and knives and took control of the pier. The guard A, uh, or in other words, the Irish police, eventually were able to land in force and end the riot. After the prison riot that year, all families who lived on, um, lived on the island had to leave. Yes, there were actually families living on Spike Island right alongside the military fortification and the prison. They were mostly families of like the guards and people who worked there. Yeah. Uh, so the prison would finally close its doors in 2004. Today, Spike Island is now an increasingly popular historical tourist attraction, with tours departing from Cove bringing tourists to explore the fort and its fascinating history. Just like America's infamous prison island Alcatraz, Spike Island and Fort Mitchell are not without their own ghost stories. 
convicts, convicts sent to serve a prison sentence on the island often never returned, and many of their spirits are believed to linger on there today. The prisoners' agony was so intense uh, that several tried to seek release through suicide. For this reason, Spike Island became known as Hell on Earth to some of its inmates. For years, the high death rate was blamed on the famine raging outside, but this was proved to be inaccurate. The discovery of a graveyard, which had been dug deeply, um, dug deeply uh, has unearthed over 1,300 convicts who died on the island between 1847 and 1883. Most succumbed to catastrophic public health conditions due to overcrowding. Others will point to the prison riot to explain the paranormal bedlam that takes place on the island. It's likely that the hauntings can be tied back to all aspects of the prison's troubling history and more. There are reports of many apparitions on Spike Island, including that of a period military soldier hanging out by the fireplace at Fort Mitchell. Footsteps, disembodied voices, and unexplained noises are common throughout Fort Mitchell. Lights will also turn on and off on their own, adding to the eerie ambiance. Being in Ireland, there is of course a good old Irish banshee that is spotted near the ramparts. Research undertaken by University College Cork and the Ireland, Ireland's Heritage Team has uncovered several stories of ghostly reports, including soldiers firing at a seeming, uh, seemingly phantom intruders. Irish naval cadets stationed on the island in the 1980s reported strange occurrences disturbing their accommodation. Prison guards from the 1980s reported prisoners uh, complaining of a black entity visiting their cells by night. There was also that spirit, uh, the apparition of a white female that has been reported by many visitors to the island. And then there is the chilling tale from a little girl named Eileen who lived on Spike Island with her family over a century ago when her father was serving in the army there. One day, as she was walking across the island, she saw a troubling sight looking, uh, looking at her over a wall. It appeared to be human and very tall, but it was kind of grisly and slimy as she described it. Worst of all, replacing its eyes were two dark and cavernous voids. Terrified, Eileen staggered to a nearby cottage and told her story. The cottage's inhabitants were unsurprised. They told her that many folks had also seen the same thing in the same place, and some soldiers of the Irish army had even fired at this entity without it having any effect. Of the ghosts that have been identified, there is the restless spirit of John Mitchell. I don't think any relation to Fort Mitchell's name, but anyways. John Mitchell um, was a prisoner at the jail for three days before being shipped off to Bermuda and eventually Australia. Mitchell is a prominent figure in Irish history as an outspoken advocate for Irish independence from British rule in the mid-1800s. His activism saw, his, um, saw him brought up on charges of treason against the British Crown under the newly passed Treason Felony Act. The act was written with activists like John Mitchell in mind, and, well, he was convicted of sedition. During his incarceration, J uh, Mitchell wrote a jail journal which would become famous and shock the world for exposing the dark age conditions of Spike Island and other prisons in the Victorian penal system. It seems that his short time at Spike Island left a lasting impression as he appears as a white mist in the cell where he was incarcerated for his short stay. And then there is the heart-wrenching story of Nellie Organ, who moved to Spike Island with her family when her father was a soldier stationed there in 1903. She displayed a spiritual awareness as soon as she could speak, constantly displaying her religious knowledge and spiritual passion. She adored the walk along, with, uh, along Spike Island's shoreline to the village church that she often made with her mother. While living on Spike Island, Nellie's mother tragically died of tuberculosis. Unfortunately, Nellie was also not long for the world, as she was diagnosed with turret, uh, Toriello Carey syndrome, which affected her jaw. Despite her severe, uh, the severity of her illness, her religious devotion grew. Uh, Nellie would describe, uh, begin to describe visions and conversations with God and Jesus. She displayed knowledge of the Trinity beyond her years. 
Incredibly, she could tell without fail whether or not a person had been to Mass and received Holy Communion. In spite of her illness, she was always said to be in good spirits and her positivity both inspired and upset the sisters that cared for her. At the age of five, she gained special permission to take her First Communion shortly before her death. After passing away in 1908, she was buried in her communion dress at St. Joseph's Cemetery in Cork. She was moved to the Good Shepherd's Cemetery, where she, spent, uh, where she had spent her last days, per the request of the nuns that cared for her. On exhuming her body one year after her burial, the priest and two men present reported that she was found to be completely intact, unchanged in appearance as if she had been buried the day before. Even her jaw was unscathed. The story of little Nellie is now back before the Council of Rome, who is considering her for sainthood. Over 110, year, uh, excuse me, over 110 years after Pope Pius X asked for uh, the sainthood to be considered. In the years since the Pope's initial request, people who have prayed at the grave of Nellie have reported uh, miraculous... Uh, miraculous events, and a tribute to her, a tribute wow, to her? You really didn't do that one too apparently you? autocorrect really did me wrong here. <laughs> uh, yeah, visitors to her grave have reported uh, miraculous events attributed to her um, with some of her, and uh, some of her, a tribute to her life with some of her belongings can be seen at Spike Island today. Oh my god, I really botch that. <laughs> Sorry, everybody. I hope you all got the gist of that. Anyways, the paranormal activity continues on at Spike Island today, and if you are brave enough to be amongst the thousands of people who travel here every year, you may be fortunate, or unlucky enough, to have your own brush with this island's spirited past. <laughs> have a shot. I'm a little tongue-tied. What? Have a shot. Can you have a shot? No. Say you have oh, a shot. I have a shot. I need to take a shot. Okay, noted. Loosen that tongue up. I saw Ooh Banshee, but that's about all I saw from mm. Hunter. Oh. Uh, Patrick asked, what monastic order from the one the seventh century? I do not know. That is an excellent I question. I would have to go back and look it up. I just uh in our research, we saw it referred to as a monastic order. Mm -hmm. So I would have to dig that up. All right. So we're going to go to Glendale Monastery, since we're talking about monastic orders. Uh, this is east in County Wicklow, uh, just south of Dublin. Wicklow is a home of Glendale Mon Monastic Village site, a place that is known for its haunting as much as its historic heritage. Appropriately named Glendow, it means Glen of Two Lakes. And there are two lakes here surrounded by monastic ruins that date back as far as the 6th century when the settlement was found by St. Kevin. St. Kevin was a descendant of one of the ruling families of Leinster. Leinster, excuse me. As a young man, he studied under three holy men and went to live at Glendow in the hollow of a tree. His religious devotion and somewhat eccentric lifestyle drew a small group of followers to him. They formed the backbone for this settlement. After a life of sleeping on stones, wearing animal skins, barely eating according to legend, making friends with birds and animals, Kevin died sometime around 618. Despite Kevin's passing, Glendale flourished for the next 600 years, but not without trials and tragedy. The site was frequently visited by raiders, resulting in the deaths of many holy men over the years. And in its days of glory, the settlement included not only churches and monastic cells, but also workshops, greenhouses, and an infirmary, farm buildings, and of course, houses for everybody. Most of the buildings that survive today date from the 10th through the 12th centuries, including an old round tower, St. Kevin's Kitchen, a cathedral, and of course, a cemetery. Glendale's rise and fall in the turbulent history have certainly left behind enough fuel for spirited happenings. One of the most common sightings is that of a ghostly hooded black figure, which many suspect is St. Kevin himself. There are many other spirits lingering here as well, including a very old story of a woman in red, thought to be the legendary Kathleen. 
The story has been told and retold by many, and Kathleen has been immortalized in various poems and songs. There are two versions of Kathleen's story. One version recounts the story of a local girl named Kathleen who fell in love with a young, handsome St. Kevin. Kathleen actually tries to seduce St. Kevin, but he was having none of it. He grabbed handfuls of nettles and stung Kathleen about the face, arms, and feet until she came to her senses. Kathleen's heart was then filled with remorse for her actions. She fell to her knees and begged Kevin for forgiveness. Kevin prayed that God would help Kathleen see the error of her ways. His prayers were answered, and Kathleen became a sincere convert soon afterward. The second version of the story refers to the drowning of Kathleen. In this story, Kathleen became so infatuated with young Kevin that she followed him to his cave high up in the side of Lundoth Mountain, a place now known as St. Kevin's Bed. Kevin pushed Kathleen over the edge of the mountain in anger where she fell into the lake below and drowned. While we kind of prefer the first version of the tale, no matter how Kathleen met her end, her spirit seems to carry on yet another one of Ireland's many ancient and vibrant spirits. Were you able to find an answer? Uh, I was, which surprisingly enough, if we'd actually visited the actual website for Spike Island, it's right, it's right there. But, so, I will, I will read from this uh, for uh, Spike Island, the island monastery founded in 635. Uh, it was, uh, the founder was Saint uh, Mokuda, that's M-O-C-H-U-D-A, who is also known as Saint Carthage. Uh, and he cured the High King of Ireland and was granted land, including in his pick, forevermore which I'm assuming in this pick was the original name of Spike Island. Yes, I remember yeah. that from the museum. So, yeah. Now, he set up the monastic outpost and spent one year on the island before departing. He left 40 followers behind to carry on his work and founded another famous monastery in Linsmore County, Waterford. The disciples left behind on Spike Island carried on, in, uh, carried on his work with distinction, with later descriptions stating that Ireland is a most holy place in which an exceedingly devout community constantly dwell. Now this went on pretty well until about 820 AD when the uh, Vikings paid them a little visit. Um, you can just imagine what happened there. Uh, with that said, it didn't completely wipe out the settlement. Apparently uh, there were references to a monastic settlement on and off on Spike Island for the better part of 900 years. That was one place we actually said um, when we went to the museum that's right across from Spike Island. We are like, hey, we want to go over there, but they hadn't set up the tours yet. So, yep. we'll, we'll have to go another time yeah, cause gosh, um, and go not in the winter. Yeah, what I said, prison closed in 2004. Four. Yeah, so and we, were, we there. were there in, was it 09, 010? Yeah. Or 010. I think it was 09. Yeah, so yeah, so it wasn't long after that. Just a few short years after the prison closed. So, yeah, I... <sighs> so much to go back and visit. Yep. Come on, Powerball at 29. <laughs> Just saying. But with that, ladies and gentlemen, that was our last story for this evening. It is, and I have tuckered out of Vincent right here. Yes, the, uh, the boys are sleepy. We have read them their bedtime stories. Yeah. <laughs> But thank you all so much for watching tonight. We hope you enjoyed the stories uh, going on uh, going on our, our you know, like nearly two year anniversary of doing these Facebook live shows. Yep. And next uh, show will be Haunted Whales. We actually haven't really talked that much about Welsh uh, ghost stories, so forgive the pronunciations now. Uh, yeah, that's going to be brutal. Just going to say. Yep, so... Whales that 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 <laughs> they're fun stories, but forget the pronunciation. Yes, yeah, that uh, that fourth that fourth country that makes up the UK, uh, yeah. the the one that people like it's like England, Scotland, Northern Ireland. I know there was one more. Whales tend to, to kind of fly below the radar a little yeah. bit, but with that said, they do have some pretty amazing history. Yeah, and. Pretty amazing ghost stories as well. So we are so, going to go ahead and uh, bring them forward and share some of those with you in just a couple of weeks. So, and with that, before um, then, if you want to you know chat with us, send us ideas for future stories, please do so. 
or also be at the Irish Hill um, Churchill Irish Church, Festival. Yeah, Churchill Irish Festival at the end of the month. We'll Which have is, our table there, so you can definitely come chat with us then if you're in town for that. Yep. So that's not not this coming weekend. It'll be the weekend after. Yes. So and it'll be on um, Saturday and Sunday. Yes. But we will uh, we will have representation out there uh, all weekend during the festival. Uh, we will be on Twenty Fifth Street, south of Broad. So if you want to uh, come on out and see us in person, you can pop in at our tent there at the Churchill Irish Festival. Uh, other than that, we are going to be checking out GalaxyCon next weekend. Yes, we are, so, which I'm looking forward to. Yeah, we got Lots of cool people coming in town for yep. that. So we got our, our, our weekend pass for GalaxyCon here in Richmond. Um, if you're not familiar with GalaxyCon, it's a little bit of everything. Yeah. It's it, pretty cool. It's comic books. It's um, cosplay. It's... Um, Voice actors for anime is the big league actors as well. Um, so, yeah, they're, William Shatner's always here for it, just to give you an idea. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, but we're going to meet a Brett, uh, Brett, Brett Spiner. Spiner. Yeah. Yes, Data. Data's going to be there. Um, the Wasp is going to be there, Evangelina. Um, uh, Lily. Yes, Evangeline Lily. Yep. Um, and quite a few other people. So, yeah, we are definitely looking forward to this. Patrick, Patrick says his dad's side of the family comes from Wales. Yay! <laughs> I've been to Wales. I actually went um, for a weekend uh, doing research when I was in college, uh, studying abroad over in London, and I thoroughly enjoyed it, and I want to go back. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. So, and he says he has an appreciation for how difficult the Welsh language is. Yes, I... I've... We've had some tongue twisters over the last couple of years. I have a bad feeling about this. So, yeah, forgive I us. I winced when I did the research just because I knew I was going to butcher it. Forgive us in advance. And uh, Alex, thank you for watching again. Yes. Jesus, yeah. uh, <laughs> on top of the spooks, thanks again from the Little House. Thank you again for watching. And thanks again, uh, everybody else who's still here with us this evening. Uh, yeah. But yeah, this one, we love talking about our, uh, the, the yeah, Irish. Thank you. Irish spooky stuff. Yes. So uh, with uh, with any luck, we'll be back here again in one, uh, well, I mean, we'll be back with a lot of shows between now and then, but one year uh, from now, we will come back with uh, Irish Spirits Part 3. But in the meantime, we got a lot of, a lot of other things in the works, so uh, we'll look forward to seeing y'all in a couple weeks. Yep. Hope y'all have a good night. So, all right. Good night, everybody. Bye, y'all.